It is impossible to escape AI at the moment. It has been the buzz topic on everyone's lips for 2023. But today we speak to Michael Osborne, a professor from the University of Oxford, who has specialised in AI for the best part of two decades. We speak to him about where he sees the future going and how he's using AI to help him in his job as a professor. Well, the first thing to say is that we've never been in a position with AI where things have been changing so rapidly and have had impact so broadly. So ChatGPT, for instance, the product from OpenAI, had achieved a user base of 100 million in its first three months, faster than any other consumer application ever, faster than TikTok, which took about nine or 10 months. I think reviewers are also going to be using large language models to process the text that we're producing as grand authors. And hopefully it'll show up the real inefficiencies in the process, that it's just kind of pointless that we're you know, producing text with ChatGPT only to be read by ChatGPT. And hopefully we'll think up better ways to allocate funding in future. I teach students in engineering science where, of course, they're not really producing essays where they're, you know, in subjects where essays are the main deal, the impacts might be even more severe. Instead, I'm asking them to type their questions into ChatGPT, to ask ChatGPT to explain some piece of engineering to them, and then to very carefully study its answers because I've been emphasizing to my students that ChatGPT is not 100% reliable. It is prone to hallucinations, to coming up with things that are false but difficult to spot. But actually, I think it's quite useful for my students to be doing that in-depth, careful examination of its process of reasoning to try and spot where those subtle flaws might be. And yet, nonetheless, its answers do kind of point you in the right direction. They'll flag up the sort of literatures you should be examining. So I think there is something very useful there for students today. How accurate do you think the expression is that you know these large language models are to English what the calculator was to maths? Well, I don't think that's quite right in that the calculator is a very reliable piece of technology. So it does its limited job very well, um, but doesn't do most of what we need to do in maths at all. So your calculator can't prove anything for you, to give just one example. And it's of limited use in analyzing real world engineering problems where most of the maths involved is in framing the problem in the right way, setting it up in maths that you might then um, be able to use a calculator to assist you with. Whereas large language models are quite a different beast in that they are much broader than a calculator. Like I can ask ChatGPT to do almost anything that I do today. I can ask it to write an entire grant proposal. I can ask it to write a scientific paper. I think artists um, have a right to understand the ways in which the images that they've produced have contributed to the outputs of these models. Um, and so until those kinds of issues are kind of hashed out until we've had a broad societal discussion about whether or not uh, text to image models are actually theft, they're actually, you know, infringing upon the rights of artists, I'm a bit uncomfortable using them. And so, um, you know, I've essentially committed to not posting any more illustrations or um, simulacra of photos that have been produced by these models. Right, well, I think regulation is certainly coming. But today it's been a little bit too slow and too limited, it's fair to say. So, I mean, the current state of play is that essentially AI is regulated only by big tech itself, which is not very satisfactory. <laughs> and um, there have been all these really worrying things that big tech have done. Um, you know, these models, for instance, have been released while very much being capable of producing hate speech, which I think is alarming. But the concern is that in practice, what often happens is that an algorithmic AI driven decision making process is given to a human to simply rubber stamp. And, um, you know, unless the human and the AI are working much more closely, unless there's 
much more careful integration of algorithmic decision making with human oversight, with the AI becoming more interpretable, better understood, and with recourse provided to the people whose um, you know lives are actually impacted by these decisions. I don't think we're going to see good outcomes. It's not enough just to assume that there's a human at some stage of the process who is going to take responsibility for everything being legit. That just doesn't work in practice. Of course, I don't think AI will just be replacing jobs. You're absolutely right that it'll be creating jobs as well. I think the first thing that will happen, the most important thing that will happen is that AI will stimulate demand for existing occupations. So, you know, we can talk about new occupations like prompt engineers, but history teaches us that entirely new job titles take a long time to, um, you know, become mass employers. And, you know, in the last 10 years, we've seen talk about um, social media interns or data scientists as being new types of jobs, but they've remained relatively niche. These haven't been big job creators to date. So instead, what we'll see is new job creation in existing occupations like software engineers. I think software engineers are likely to see only further demand as the cost of producing software comes uh, ever lower. People will think of new ways of using software. Um, the demand for software seems almost unlimited. And um, I don't see that trend dying out anytime soon. So I'd expect at least for the next few years, software engineering is still a good occupation to enter, despite the occupation potentially being transformed by the introduction of these new models. A few years ago, we wrote a paper titled The Future of Skills, which looked at which skills might be most in demand in the future. And um, TLDR, the skills were kind of what you'd expect, advanced cognitive skills, like the ability to be creative and to be social in various ways. But one interesting thing that also came out of that study was that we found that almost all occupations, even if they were likely to be impacted by AI and see some reduction in demand as a result of other trends in labor markets, almost all occupations could move to another occupation that would be high demand with relatively small changes to their current skill mix. So just as you said, web developers have a very transferable suite of skills. And even if they're losing work as web developers, they might be able to move into other software engineering applications. For instance, um, during the pandemic, we realized that we can do a lot of things remotely. We can use technology like Riverside that we're using today to have a conversation that historically we would have had in person. And these kind of remote working technologies allow workers who are getting a bit too old to undertake a strenuous daily commute to continue to contribute to their workplaces, which I think is all to the good. I think AI is also really helpful in monitoring long-term health problems, which of course become more common as we age, in that um, I wear an Apple Watch, for instance, which records my heart rate and blood oxygen and that kind of thing. And um, similar wearable devices can be used to flag up any signs of imminent crashes in chronic health conditions, which I think is really important in keeping on top of some of the things that plague older workers' lives. So AI is definitely having a moment. And as I mentioned before, ChatGPT has reached more people than not just any AI previously, but any consumer application before. So more and more people are thinking about how AI might be used to do their work, to um, also enhance their pleasure, to um, you know plan their trips more effectively, for instance. So um, the world is really waking up to the potential of AI, and certainly it's realizing that AI can be used to do things that are helpful, that are interesting, but at the same time, the world is waking up to the harms that AI might deliver. And we've been speaking a lot about potential economic harms with AI substituting for work and miserating workers. But others are also thinking about, as we mentioned, AI as a form of theft of creative work and AI as a means of um, promoting biased or um, actually erroneous information that um, AI might serve quite a damaging role as propaganda bots in our democracies. That has been, as I knew it would be, Michael, a brilliant uh, 
interview and we'd love to get you on again at some stage because this space is changing so quickly and is so interesting and you have so much experience in it you know um it's been <laughs> great to have you on thanks michael no well, you're far too kind and um yeah i've really enjoyed our conversation and i'm certainly happy to um come back on sometime thanks jimmy <laughs>